All righty. So, all right. So, uh, this hour we're going to talk about why uh, the paper um, has this title, multi-point testing of gas wells. And what really is meant by multi-point uh, means that you set the well on on different chokes, basically. It's very difficult to control the rate of a well being completely constant. So you usually just set a choke and you say that's a test. Now, the, uh, the reason for that is because the flow in porous media, and particularly for gas wells, um, may deviate from Darcy's law. Uh, Darcy's law is kind of the, the standard uh, law describing flow in porous media, but with the analogy to pipe flow, the Darcy law equation kind of describes the pressure drop with velocity as does laminar flow in pipe. Okay? And if you transition from laminar into turbulent flow, where you have more chaos going on, more energy being, in a sense, wasted because of all of the flow not being one-dimensional along the path of flow, but being multi-dimensional before it makes it from here to here. It has to go through a longer path and through more resistance, so you get more pressure drop. And in porous media, you have the same kind of thing. Now, they don't like to call it turbulence uh, because the pore sizes are so small and you don't really have the same kind of effect as turbulence. But sometimes we call it turbulent flow just because it's deviating from the normal. Uh, sometimes it's just called non-Darcy flow. It's probably the best, uh, though you can have non-Darcy behavior for different reasons. Um, and then, in particular, what we're going to talk about now is so-called high-velocity flow effects. Okay, and already in the early 1900s, maybe even the late 1800s, I'm not sure, there was an equation that was describing this kind of flow for gas at high velocities in porous media. And the, the um, equation in one dimensional, uh, for one dimensional flow looks something like this. You've got mu over k, that's the Darcy contribution to pressure drop times the velocity. And so this is our Darcy component, a pressure drop plus a velocity squared. Actually, some of the earliest um, laws describing this had to the power n, but um, in general we use the, the squared. And in front of here you have a rock property beta, um, and you have the density of the fluid, uh, in analogous to uh, fluid property viscosity, rock property permeability. This is rock this is fluid. Well, this is a rock property, and this is a fluid property. And then the velocity squared. So this is uh, normally attributed to a guy named Forsheimer, which I always misspell his name, but something like that. Um, German, Austrian, I'm not sure. I should be. You should look it up on Google, but okay. So this is the equation that we operate with to describe. Um, and this occurs, basically this term here kicks in, becomes important for what, I think Muscat was the first one to coin it, or to quantify it this way, for a so-called Reynolds number, equivalent Reynolds number, greater than about one, I think. And that's defined, this Reynolds number was defined as, <laughs> I probably can't remember this now. How's the normal Reynolds number defined? There's a diameter, um, viscosity, and velocity, right? Density. Density. And density. density. Give me the equation and I'll... I'll 
density, velocity, diameter is on the top. Okay. Okay, there we go. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, the other professors of the department, they don't, they don't understand why I use this teaching system where I record my stupidity. You know, because, you know, it, you know, you're supposed to be a professor, you're supposed to remember things like this. But, you know, the other professors don't remember, like, 37.339.14, and all these crazy numbers I remember. So this is the Reynolds number. So what he said is that this is going to be our, our average grain diameter, I think is what he used. The average grain diameter, or maybe it was the pore diameter, I don't remember. I think it was grain. They're approximately the same. In microns, you know, it would be order of magnitude microns. Um, and <clears throat> so, so for example, um, for gas, let's just put in some numbers. Uh, 100 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, diameter, average grain, um, maybe 50 microns. Um, viscosity, uh, 2, is a 0.02 centipoise, which is millipascal second. And what do we end up, what do we have left? Velocity, yeah. So in velocity, um, um, well, let's just solve this for when Reynolds number is 1. So to get velocity, let's find, uh, this is uh, velocity. Um, let's say that we've got a, Let's say that we've got a rate of 100,000 cubic meters per day. That's standard cubic meters per day. Um, convert that to reservoir. We need the BG. Let's say that that's 0.01 cubic meters per standard cubic meter. This is standard cubic meters here. Um, so that would be uh, well bore. We take it at the well bore. Or let's just take it at, at at one meter away from the well bore, or something like this. In a point uh, five meters, uh, that would be too big for a well bore. But just say that we're going to look just a half a meter away from the well bore. Okay. Um, so the velocity. The Darcy velocity, I think it's supposed to use uh, the, the pore velocity. This should be probably pore velocity, I would suspect. I don't remember. It would be the, the rate uh, over the area. So the rate is 10 to the fifth times 0 0.01. Area is pi. Um, 0.5 over 2 uh, 2 pi RH so let's say thickness is um, 20 meters something like that so and then that's meters per day so we don't want that. We want meters per second. So we have um, per day. So we want how many seconds in a day? Uh, Thirty-six hundred in an hour. Twenty-four. So that's that's seconds per day. So that pore velocity ends up. Can somebody calculate that? 10 to the fifth, convert it down to reservoir uh, pressure. You know, this would be, for example, at 100 bar or something, maybe like that. A half a meter away from the well bore, um, area 2 pi RH. Excuse me. 
We need a porosity in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, it, it shouldn't be. It should be just 0 0.5. Thank you. 0 0.5. I was thinking diameter. Um, uh, if we need pore velocity, I, I don't remember if you use pore velocity or Darcy velocity. I just don't remember. But if we use pore velocity, we need we need a fee down here, I think. So that we can add porosity. 20% meters per second. I sure hope I come up with a number bigger than one. <laughs> okay, because you should get velocities, I think, uh, 100,000 cubic meters per day. That's uh, three and a half million, three and a half million cubic feet per day. I, I, I'm hoping. We, we may have to take this rate a little bit higher. Uh, maybe let's do that. Let's, let's put, make it a big well. Um, under the, let's make it 10 to the 6th. That's a big well. 10 to the 6th. Okay. I got the calculator. Make me do all the work here, huh? Okay, one million times 0 0.01 divided by two divided by 3.14 divided by 0 0.5 divided by 20 divided by 3600 divided by 24. This is not looking good. Divided by 0.2. Okay, that's 0.01 meter per second. All right, about 0.01. So then we put that into our Reynolds number calculation. Uh, density of gas, 100. Velocity, 0.01. Uh, diameter in meters is... Uh, uh, what was it? 50, 10 to the minus sixth, and point uh, O, and then we need three more zeros, Pascal's seconds. Nobody going to help me out here? Huh? Ah, good. Okay, so for, for these Reynolds numbers, you're de deviating from Darcy's law. So this is just an example calculation showing, um, showing this case. Now, if we use this equation instead of Darcy's law, how does this reservoir rate equation change? And I'm just going to just introduce that to you today to get started. Okay, so if you do the same kind of derivation of this for radial cylindrical flow instead of x, you use radius and you have a, a geometry, then what you end up with is... Um, equation that looks exactly like what we had before
Now, how can that be? Okay, that's the same equation we wrote before. Well, in reality, it's written this way. This is the skin that we talked about earlier. This is damage geometry. Whatever else you might figure out. And then we have a term, an extra term, D, Q. That's the same rate as we have over here. So in reality, it's a quadratic equation in rate if we solve it and do all the manipulation. That term there, S plus DQ, okay, is often written just as the total skin, where this is the rate dependent skin contribution. In other words, that part of the skin increases as the rate increases. So we might have had the driller's damage here plus four because of drilling problems and whatever else. But if you, if you run a test and assess how this entire constant changes, where we know that the KH is not changing with rate, temperature doesn't change with rate, this doesn't change with rate, and the skin here doesn't change with it. The only thing changing with rate is this term here. And what you'll find is something that looks like this. And the slope of this line is D. Okay? So it has units of 1 over rate, which might be something like that, or 1 over million standard cubic feet per day. Like that. <coughs> D is proportional with beta in the Forsheimer equation. Okay, it comes from that term, beta rho. Okay, so you can see that you're not going to have to remember a lot of different equations. They always end up looking the same. But, you know, remember if it was transient, infinite acting, then we replace the log R yard W minus three quarters with PD. You know, that was to take care of the transient, infinite acting behavior. In this case, if we get non-Darcy behavior, we just call it a different kind of skin. So the equation of still the, the equation of itself is not really changing. Okay, for practical purposes. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, this equation says that when we increase the rate of uh, producing gas from the bottom hole pressure, it's it's act like a skin. Uh, it means that we are supposed to see more pressure drop in bottom hole pressure. That's right. Uh, why we look at it as this, you know, uh, what is the physics behind it? Why the increasing in the uh, rate of the gas, it's behaved like a skin? Well, it's, it's just how you express it. I mean, the first thing is that um, it adds pressure drop. That's clear from the equation here. Okay? We're adding pressure drop when this term kicks in, right? Well, skin is nothing more than additional pressure drop. 
where we put the pressure drop doesn't really matter. And this is just a convenient, simple way to express the pressure drop as a dimensionless pressure drop. You remember skin is just a dimensionless, dimensionless pressure drop. It's just that it's rate dependent. The higher the rate, the more pressure drop you get. Uh, the more dimensionless pressure drop you get. So it's just the way that it, it doesn't matter how you treat it. Now you can rewrite the equation in terms of rate, which is what Fetkovich does. Okay? So what Fetkovich does, he writes P. He actually uses pressure squared, but I'm not going to get into that. It's okay. But basically, if we do it like Fetkovich, we say that basically the reservoir pressure drop expressed as a pseudo pressure. Okay. We just have to solve this for that. So you have to move it to the other side. So you've got um, QG times TR. I'm going to take this part here. Um, like that. Plus QG TR KH, I think. Square D. Okay. which is just a quadratic equation in rate. You can write it as, I think Vetkovich writes it as B Q squared plus A Q. Is that what you, yeah. Yeah, so you can see here, you've got um, yeah. so the B is, yeah. so basically he writes this as B Q G squared plus A Q G minus is equal to zero. That's just to solve for rate given a certain uh, bottom of flowing pressure. A and B. So So how to determine A and B. Okay. At minimum, you have to have two different rates and two different bottom of flowing pressures, right? That, that should be clear. There are two unknowns, and so we have to have minimum two flow rates. Basically, Q, G, P, W, F measurements. But because of uncertainties in the measurements of rates for sure, maybe pressures, and you have transients, and you have all sorts of things going on, 
what they typically do as a standard, you need a minimum of two, and the industry standard is three and typically four different rates. Flow tests. That is four chokes. Thus the name multi point testing of gas wells. Okay? So the paper is about how to design such a test, how to interpret such a test, and what you get out of such a test is basically the KH and skin term and the D term. Okay? A and the B. Basically, these are the unknowns, but it's a composite factor, so you don't really know what it is, and this is the unknown. Once you find those constants A and B, they should be that forever for, the, for a gas well. So you just need to determine them once. So this multi-point multi testing of a gas well is something you do. You do, drill the well, complete the well, and you put the well on production test at three or four rates. <coughs> Each rate is flowed maybe 12 hours, assuming that you get into pseudo-steady state conditions within the 12 hours. Between each flow, they generally shut the well in, at least in theory. So there's a series of types of tests, and the one is, is called the isochronal. Well, and the characteristic is that each flow period is either the same duration. For example, uh, you know, six hours each, 12 hours, whatever. Or that the time at which you collect the pressure and the rate is at the same, is after the same amount of production. Or we collect the PWF rate point at the same production time. Thus the name isochronal, same time. So it's either that they physically produce the well for the same amount of time and then they use the rate and pressure at the end of that period or they might flow it longer, but they say that at, you know, each flow period may be somewhere between um, you know, 10 and 20 hours, but then they have to agree on a common time, so it might be 10 hours, or eight hours, whatever. 
and in general there should be a shut-in between each rate or between each flow period. in order to allow the reservoir pressure to be reached. And that should be about the same for each flow period. You shouldn't see any effect of depletion during these different tests. Same each time. So I can sketch a typical isochronal test. Maybe I'll plot. Um, I'll plot both rate and bottom of flowing pressure, except I'll put this one in red. Okay, so the rates might look like this. And in reality, the rates are going to, they're not going to be completely constant. They're going to be probably something like this. Okay. Okay. The bottom of flowing pressure would look something like this. We go from initial pressure All right. You got to do a little lassoing here. something like that. So basically we see that we're coming back to the same average pressure each time. Now, because they're not equal production periods, this is maybe uh, 9 hours, 12 hours, 9 hours, uh, 15 hours. So we have to use a common denominator. We'll use nine, 9 hours. So we're going to use this point here and this, this right here. That rate, I'm sorry, be after nine hours, be that rate there. Nine hours, be that rate there. And one, two, three, that rate there. And it would be pressure at this point, pressure at that point, and pressure at that point. So those would be the four um, pressure rate combinations. Okay, so we're basically we're taking this at constant time period of nine hours. 
Okay. Now exactly how you analyze to get the A and B. You can rewrite this equation up here, the quadratic equation. Divide through by rate. And that will equal to A plus B Q. All right? So if you plot this on the y-axis versus rate on the x-axis, then you get the slope and intercept being A and B. Convert the average pressure, pseudo pressure, bottom of flowing pressures, pseudo pressure, divided by gas rate, plot versus gas rate. Any questions? Now, for the most part, you can assume that the Forsheim or non Darcy equation is not needed for oil wells, I mean, in general. But in fact, it was Fetkevich in 1972, which was just after the Equifisk field was discovered, that he took data mostly from the Equifisk field production test data. He had them running multi-rate tests on these oil wells. Why? Because he didn't just say, well, you don't need Forsheimer equation for oil wells because Curtis said you don't need it. What Curtis said is that you probably don't need it. Okay, Equifisk was like 150 meters thick. It was a light oil, 0.2 centipoise. The rates were high, very high. It was a very high pressure, 7,000 pounds. They were going to get very high rates. So what did he do? He didn't assume anything. He just went to Mr. Muscat. He had the numbers, density of oil, 700 kilograms per cubic meter. Viscosity of oil, 0.2 centipoise. Velocity was very high because the rates were high. The uh, pore diameter of, um, in fact, chalk is very small. It's only about half a micron. But he put in all the numbers and calculated the Reynolds number, and it exceeded 1. So based on that, we're going to run multi-rate tests of the Equifisk oil well. The main reason for that was because they didn't perforate it the 150 meters thick. They perforated 15 meters thick and produced at very high rates because the entire 150 meters was contributing flow. But it was being converged into a very small cross-sectional area. So you got very high velocities near the well. And in fact, he published the data. He did the analysis. Now, he doesn't use this kind of analysis here. He uses something else we'll talk about tomorrow, which is the log-log representation of this. Okay, it's a different rep graphical representation. But he showed that well after well, the initial tests in the Equifisk field showed non-Darcy effect. Okay, so if you haven't read the paper, please do before tomorrow. We're going to continue working on that paper, and we're going to bring in the well... Uh, pressure drop in the production tubing.